But one of my favorite memories is sitting on the the front of the uh, Step and Center stage uh-huh. with Holland Wolf and a piano player named Sonny Land Slim and Fred McDowell. And we were they were passing around a bottle of apricot brandy and we were sharing the bottle of apricot brandy <laughs> and they were oh, and so they cool. and they were telling dirty jokes you know uh-huh. <laughs> and i and i'm i'm this uh you know at this time i'm like this 23 year old kid and i'm just like in awe of what's going on you know you heard that there that's perry aberly one of the key founders of the Midwest Blues Festival in the 1970s at the University of Notre Dame, talking about hanging out with some of the performers. More of that later, but first. Welcome to Round the Bend Now and Then, a podcast that shines a light on the South Bend and Mishawaka areas past and present. Through interviews with local business owners, leaders, and community members, our listeners and I learn together about all of the great people and great things going on in our community as we also learn about South Bend and Mishawaka's history and how intertwined our past is with our present. At the very beginning, you heard a gentleman talk about being starstruck and in awe that he was just a 23-year-old kid passing around a bottle of apricot brandy, listening to a group of gentlemen, including one named Howling Wolf, telling some dirty jokes. You see, that man, Mr. Wolf, was one of the most popular blues artists in the country at that time. And that 23-year-old kid, he was the one that led the charge to organize a three-day event that would bring multiple famous blues artists to the Steppen Center at the University of Notre Dame called the Midwest Blues Festival. In 1971, Perry Aberly, a grad student at the time, approached the administration of the school and pitched an idea, an idea that had never been done on campus. He proposed a three-day blues festival to be held at the Steppen Center, which at that time was a popular venue for all types of events on campus. Little did he know at that time that first, Notre Dame would agree to it, and second, that the blues festival he was pitching would be the first of many more festivals throughout the 1970s and would bring popular blues artists by the likes of Muddy Waters, Albert King, Johnny Lee Hooker, Howlin' Wolf, Buddy Guy, Junior Wells, to name a few, to South Bend. By the end of the 1970s, the South Bend Tribune touted the festival series as Notre Dame's contribution to the preservation of classic American blues. The Tribune also said it was one of the nation's longest-running blues get-togethers and the only event of its type in the Midwest. And I was surprised that in my local history dorkness, I'd only heard about the Midwest Blues Festival a few times on a few Facebook history posts, but I really didn't know too much about it. But then I received an email, roundtheben 574 at gmail.com if anybody wants to reach out. I received an email from a gentleman named Tim Aberly. He said that his father was one of the main forces behind creating and putting on these blues festivals in the 1970s. So I looked into it and did some research, and wow, this is a story in our local history that has to be told. This whole story intrigues me so much, and it's so multi-layered, that it's hard to unpack it all in just a few minute intro, but it's much deeper than just a concert. I'm gonna put on my uh, Sophia Petrillo hat here, Picture this, it's 1971, and you have a Catholic university that the administration is more historically buttoned up in general, and the student body, especially at that time, was definitely majority white students, white males to be exact, as it was an all-male school until the following year. A group of these students loved the blues so much that they wanted to spread that love, so they pitched an idea to the school to have a three-day blues festival right on campus. The school said yes, and uh, that's just one layer there. A group of 20-year-olds were in charge of a three-day blues festival on campus, and that alone to me is wild. But it's even deeper than that to me. You see, every single performer is African-American, and they're traveling from all over, meeting at an all-white Catholic university to perform. Another layer is that this Catholic university sits in a diverse city with over 100,000 people, many 
African American just like the performers. Again, this is 1971. And if you've listened to our episode on the block, the 1200 block of West Washington Street, you'd hear that unfortunately, only a few years prior, there was so much racial tension in our city that it caused awful riots that to this day are still a sad scar on our city. But the blues festivals that those college kids put on throughout the 1970s went off beautifully with everyone getting along and having a fantastic time together, all surrounding their common love of the blues. Like I said, the more I dove into the story of the Midwest Blues Festivals in the 1970s at Notre Dame, the more I knew I had to try to share it. So thank you, Tim Aberly, for introducing me to your father, Perry. So in this episode, I meet with Perry Aberly, the college kid with a deep love of the blues who in 1971 pitched a crazy idea to have that three-day blues festival right on campus. I met with Perry remotely from his South Carolina home, and it was clearly evident that this dude has had a lifelong love of the blues. Just from the background in his office, I mean, you could see blues posters, album covers, shelves of books, and everything like that. In the hour that I met with him, I could tell that he is an absolute encyclopedia of knowledge on the subject. As you'll hear in this episode, Perry describes the beginning of the festival and how it took shape. We also talk about how cool it was to hang out with some of the very nice and humble performers. And we also get into the impact that the festival had on the local blues scene. So kick back and enjoy my chat with Perry Aberly, and I hope you enjoy learning as much about the Midwest Blues Festival as I did. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Perry. Well, I'm originally from Louisville, Kentucky, and okay. uh, the high school I went to called Flagey High School was the same high school that Paul Horning went to. So nice. the trophy case at the high school was full of trophies with Paul Horning's name on them. Uh -huh. So between my junior and senior year, a friend of mine, a friend of mine and myself went to uh, went up to uh, South Bend to visit the campus. Uh -huh. And uh, uh -huh. we went up, we came up to uh, South Bend to visit Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just fell in love with the place. I came home. My dad was a uh, blue collar assistant foreman at a distillery in Louisville. And uh -huh. we sat down, had a talk. He said, well, if you can pay half, I'll pay half. So. I went to, you know, went to work and of course during high school. And then, um, I got in, and of course that was a big thing. If you can get in, I'll do that. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, I went away, I came to South Bend, stayed there, uh, -huh. uh, got my undergraduate degree, got my master's and continued on with the PhD, but then life interfered. So I didn't get that. Of course. What you'll hear next is a true, you never know what you can get away with unless you ask. And Perry asked, and he received, a lot more responsibility than he thought. We talk about the origins of the festival next. It started, uh, my roommate graduated, went to U of M. They had a, what was called the Ann Arbor Blues and Jazz Festival there. I went up there to see him. We went to that, and it was, um, I thought, well, why can't we do something like this at Notre Dame? So I went back and pitched it and uh okay and so you so you were a you were one of the original folks yeah the year before well uh, about 1967 68 okay uh there were two artists i think it was uh robert pete williams and son house who were the rediscovered country blues guys they appeared in what okay. they appeared in washington hall in concerts uh 1969 okay and 1969 in the summer there was a two-day um, J.B. Hutto, Lightning Hopkins came and played. So there was a pres okay. there was a presence I on see. campus, but the festival was was my proposal. Okay. And, okay. Uh, so they said, "Well, how much? You know, we'll give you." And then they told me they'd give me ten thousand dollars. Okay. And uh, they didn't tell me that it was supposed to cover everything. So I spent ten thousand dollars on talent, and oh wow! So when I say not only was you know the effort voluntary, the sound system, the lights, everything was volunteered by 
friends and people in town that came to, you know, were into the blues and that. And so it was a real labor of love for everybody involved. But but we were able to get the first year. We had um, Holland Wolf headlined Monday or Friday night. Muddy, uh-huh. Wa- Muddy Waters headlined Saturday night. And Buddy Guy and Junior Wells were there on Sunday. So, I mean, it was an amazing festival. And they were, you know, plus a load of other people were there too. So, so literally, you there were inklings of a few blues concerts around campus, right. and then you had proposed, let's 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 do it. Yeah, let's, like let's get some, let's do it right. Yeah, and they said, and and so, and this was a part of the um, the student union cultural arts commission. It was called, the, how, yeah, it was called the cultural arts commission. And so you were already on that? No, I just went to them and oh, and uh, and I, I see. and I didn't even think they would go for it because I was a graduate student. Okay. I, and I thought they were limited to undergraduates. So, right. so they said, well, you know, you'll need to have some undergraduates with you so we can make it legit. And I, okay. I and I always did. Um, but that's how we started off. And we went from 71, Man. went from 71 through 78, 79 was the last one. When you pitched it to the school's administration, were there any stipulations at all or yeah. any... Only that I have undergraduates involved with me because of cultural arts okay. technically was that, but they, uh, you know, we uh, they had a few concerns because we always paid the artists in cash. Um, oh. <laughs> so what we what we worked out with the administration was we had um, checks for each of the okay. artists, and then we had cash. So we, okay. we would give them the check, they would endorse the check back to us, and we would give them the cash. That was one of the things they were a little bit leery about, you know, that was going to work or not. But it, it was, uh, bec- well, you know, there were, there were a number of reasons for that. I mean, the guys needed the money to pay their ba- their side men in the band. Okay. Or they, okay. And they needed it for the road. And yeah. a lot of them didn't have bank accounts. I mean, this is a time when <sighs> they weren't getting paid like blues guys get paid now. These were... A lot of these guys had day jobs still, you know, but unreal. Yeah. But, and a lot of them quite honestly were, um, I guess to be a a gentle way to say it is they were functionally illiterate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, mean, Albert Albert King couldn't read or write. Wow. He could sign his name. I mean, I've got an autograph. Correct. I've got an autographed album by him, but, Uh but, uh, but a lot of them just, and, and, and you were you had to be very sensitive about that, you know, and careful. So even as wow. sometimes even asking them to sign a check could be problematic. But then they would man, they'd walk off with it and they'd come back with it, their signature on the back. So <laughs> whether they signed it or somebody else signed yeah, it. Yeah, and then we did <laughs> and then we pay them, you know. You pitched it to them, and they had ten thousand dollars. Now that's not a small chunk of change in nineteen seventy one. Uh, true, right? But when you think about, you know, we were paying. Uh, well, there was a guy named Mississippi Fred McDowell who abs- I absolutely worshipped, and was okay. Three hundred and fifty bucks, you know. Um, okay. We had. Uh, let me look at. Let me look at my poster. Do a cheat sheet. <laughs> do a cheat sheet here for you. <laughs> um, well, we had we had homesick James, and he came in with a guy named Robert Jr. Lockwood. And those were like, they were like five hundred bucks. Oh, so we we, had, okay. We had yeah. we had a guy, uh, a piano player uh, from Chicago, Little Brother Montgomery, was like three hundred bucks. Muddy Waters, we adds up. Yeah, Muddy Waters, we paid two thousand for. Or Holland Wolf, Holland Wolf, we paid Ooh. two thousand. Muddy Dang. Muddy, we paid two thousand. Buddy Guy and Junior Wells, we paid two thousand. So sixty percent of yeah. the uh, that, <laughs> of the ten grand was I, right there. But you know, buddy guy now is getting, I mean, forty, fifty, sixty thousand. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what he gets, but as college kids, how do you reach out to these performers? But you yeah. had well, I just folks who helped with that. Well, I knew who I wanted to get, and this, of course, was pre okay. pre internet and stuff. So there, oh, of course, there was a lot of letter writing and phone calls, and uh huh. And I, I, um, the very first festival, I decided because at that time. There really weren't any record stores in South Bend that were selling blues. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. There was one downtown. It might have been on, um, I don't know, Wayne or, Wayne or um, Jefferson downtown between okay. right. between, Maine, between Maine and Michigan there. 
Mm-hmm. They, they, they had a real small stack of blues stuff. So I, w- I had been going to a jazz record mart in Chicago, which was Bob Kester's store. Okay. So I, okay. I went in to see Bob and uh, I told him what I was doing. And he really didn't know me except as a customer. And okay. I, I said, do you think you could front us some records on consignment to sell at the festival? Wow. And uh, he said, sure. And he started pulling records out of the racks and loaded my car up with, I don't know, four or 500 albums. And I, sa- I said, we're not keeping track of any of these. Do I need to make a list of them for you? And he goes, no, I trust you. Just bring back what you don't sell. <laughs> oh my God! And that's and, and that's what we did. And, and Bob and I became very good friends for a long time. And uh, matter of fact, there's a uh, a T Bone Walker album he put out around 1983, maybe. Okay. Called "I Want a Little Girl," and the cover of the album is Bob Kester's four year old son and my four year old daughter. Oh wow, uh, that's cool. And, and he <laughs> he took the picture at the festival. That's neat. That's really neat. He mentioned earlier about paying the performers on a limited budget. Next, we talk about what the workers were paid. No one was ever paid working for the Blues Festival. It okay. It was a totally volunteer effort from myself. Right, right. Myself on down. None of us. And that totally flabbergasted. We had people come in from University of Michigan, Ohio State, different places. Uh-huh wanting to come to the festival, see how we did it. And the first, you know, eventually within the first four or five questions, they would say, right. Well, how much are you getting paid to do this? And, <laughs> and when I said, well, we don't get paid anything, you know, I said, our, yeah. our pay is getting to see the artists that we want to see. And, Absolutely. And they would, they would just be dumbfounded, but I'm sure but it was, it was a true labor of love for, uh, for everybody involved in it at that level, you know? definitely a true labor of love to help spread their love of the blues. The few South Bend Tribune articles that I could find on the festivals mentioned that the vibe of the concerts was real mellow with a real relaxed and casual atmosphere. We talk about that next. It was always at at that time um, there was a real town and gown distinction in South Bend. Okay. Okay. And Notre Dame was very insular. Mm-hmm. So we didn't even really market a lot off campus okay. for the first festival off, right. off campus. But we did a bit and uh, we put up, we actually uh, put up folding chairs. It basically was sit on the floor in Steppen Center. Okay. But it, we put up a small set of chairs, maybe 50 or 60. Uh-huh. And uh, we didn't know if any uh, African-American people would show up or not. Right. But uh, every, every day they, uh, they showed up and they were, you know, we were all dressed in jeans and T-shirts and stuff. And uh-huh. these people came in dressed to the nine. I mean, they were like yeah. ready, like it was an experience for them. And they sat in the chairs. And um, a lot of the artists, of course, you tell, were playing to them. Because gotcha. when they saw them, it was like, okay. Yep. Uh-huh. But it was a neat experience. That's- and matter of fact, one of the newspaper articles, they said that um, this was later on. It's like a 1978. I think 77 or 78, it had said that, quote, it's a relaxed, casual show. Most people sit themselves on the floor with blankets to sit, relax, and enjoy the blues. Was that the vibe? Yeah, it was pretty much. This was also, um, and of course, Notre Dame has always been, you know, seven to ten years behind every place else culturally, (laughs) or at least back then we were. But um there was wine and beer and that, and there was, um, oh. toward, the, toward the end, there was the occasional, you could get the occasional smell of pot around it. Oh yeah. But there that was one of my questions, but there, <laughs> there were also security officers around. So we, we pretty, pretty much discouraged that or tried to put a damper on that, yeah. but they, they would look the other way on the beer or the wine. So. Well, good. They let uh, you have a little fun. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was pretty good. <laughs> it, it went well. Kids arranging all of this college kids, did the performers and you interacted with the performers? Obviously, sure. yeah, sure. Did they treat you as kids, or how? How did that work? They regarded us basically as friends. I mean, once we met them, wow. blues artists. I mean, and I worked um, with a guy named Pete Kernan that ran okay. River City Records and then continued to produce shows around South Bend, Indiana, and and, Mich- and, okay. and down at Fort Wayne and places for a long, long time. 
he, mm-hmm. he was bringing in the Beach Boys, it seemed like, every six weeks or something for a while. <laughs> but but um, they didn't, the relationship he had was a, you know, a contracting person and right. artist. With us, we were just, we were just, well, we were in awe of them, first of all. I know, that's and, crazy. Uh, and they just, they just accepted us. I, I worked with Pete. That's cool. I did some work with Pete at the Morris when he was bringing in groups like ACDC and Blue Oyster Cult. Okay. And those guys, quite honestly, there's my filter going off. They were jerks. Yeah. Uh, yep. And they had incredible, arrogant riders and expectations mm-hmm. and stuff. These yeah. these blues guys. One of my favorite memories is sitting on the the front of the uh, Step and Center stage uh-huh. with Holland Wolf and a piano player named Sunny Land Slim and Fred McDowell, and we were they were passing around a bottle of apricot brandy and we were sharing the bottle of apricot brandy <laughs> and they were oh, and so they cool. and they were telling dirty jokes you know uh-huh. <laughs> and i and i'm i'm this uh you know at this time i'm like this 23 year old kid and i'm just like in awe of what's going on you know oh my gosh i i mean literally i mean that's so neat though that that you as a kid got to interact with all them yeah and, and how cool you know how neat and then you got to pass a bottle of some brandy yeah I mean, my goodness. And we made yeah. and the go ahead. No, and, and some of them became lifelong friends. I mean, Albert King awesome. Albert King became a very good friend. Sun Seals became a very good friend. Wow. A lot. And we had uh we would have uh after festival parties at the house where they would just show up and jam at the house and You mean your student house, your college house? Well, off campus. They'd I was living I was living off, off campus. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they just show up. Yeah, so they would just come and hang out at your off campus? Yeah. What street? Do you remember what street it was? <laughs> Oh boy, the the. Uh, I'm just curious. I don't know. I lived on. Well, I was married at that time. I lived on Roosevelt for a while, which is okay. which is over off of uh, Riverside Drive, I guess. Yeah. Going out, and then I lived off of. I lived on Altgeld. Okay, so they drove all the way down there, huh? Yeah, and they just show up, and it was like, <laughs> you know, it was great. <laughs> That's amazing. That's yeah. truly amazing. Where man, where did they stay? When they were in town, uh, did most, you guys have to arrange hotels? Yeah, but most of them, because they were from Chicago and that, they usually had gigs the next night, and they were on the road. Okay. They were on the road somewhere else. I Very see. few of them I stayed see. over. Um, I can remember some of them staying at the old Howard Johnson up in Roseland. Okay. Yep. Uh, yep. Places like that, but for the most part, they were they'd play and they'd either be on the road or they uh, yeah they were in their vans or something. Unless they came and hung out with us, you know. Right. Right. Uh, were there any moments in the planning or during the actual shows where it was like an oh no moment, where like it was almost a crisis or a crisis averted? Uh, well, the first festival, uh, Mance Lipscomb, who was from Texas, the okay. country west, or a, called himself a songster blues guy, country blues guy. Um, he missed his initial plane connection and he was getting in late in the other one. So we were scrambling. Who's got a car? Who could go drive the who could go drive right. to O'Hare and pick him up? So we got <laughs> we got him. We actually had to um, we had to ask Buddy Guy and Junior to go on early on because we on, on Saturday night they were there Saturday and Sunday. On, okay. On Saturday they were playing acoustic. Okay. They were going to come out and they were both sitting on stools on the stage, Buddy on guitar and you know Junior playing harp, and they were going to be one. The cl- toward the close mm-hmm. and um, Mance wasn't there so they went on and we then Mance got there and then Mance went ahead and played after they played that was that was one um, you get people show up who would like wouldn't have a companist so then I had to go grabbing oh. grabbing students going you want to play behind so and so you want to play behind so and so and so Man. so a lot of guys got their baptism by fire playing playing back up to some of the blues guys that's amazing but, and that's amazing how like un uh, what's the word i'm thinking of like just showing up to play <laughs> yeah yeah oh yeah and, and you know one time i had a we had booked a guy named shirley griffith who's a uh-huh. guitar player from indianapolis and he showed up with a guy named jt adams who he played with regular in indy and uh you know our budgets were one was once we spent it we spent it and he was like right can you give JT a 50, if you give him 50 bucks, he'll play with me. Can he, can he play with me? 
And here I am, I had to tell him no. You know? Yeah. And I was afraid, what if I tell him no and he says he's not going to play? But, you know, it, uh-huh. it worked out okay. The guy came in and he didn't play, but he, we still got Shirley to play. Um, John Lee Hooker, when he came, we had booked John Lee Hooker to come in to do a solo electric act, which was the way okay. John Lee started out in Detroit playing. And a lot of his really good early recordings, like the ones on VJ, Boom Boom, and the, those kind of songs that he did. Okay. Uh, but at that time, he was touring with what was called the Coast to Coast Band, which is right after the Hooker and Heat stuff when he was doing his endless boogie and things. And it was really crap. I mean, Hook, mm-hmm. because Hooker would start off and he'd start playing and then he'd let the band take over and they would just riff on a boogie riff for 10 or 15 minutes. Uh-huh. So Bruce Ziegler and I got him back side of stage when he showed up with all of them and said, you can't play with these guys. And uh, so we we finally compromised that he would he would play solo until we told him he could bring the band on. Wow. And he he did not like it, but he he put on a heck of a solo show for about a half hour. But he kept leaning over to the side of the stage, looking at Bruce and me, going, "Can I boogie yet? Can I boogie yet?" That's that's crazy. I mean, that's that's a compromise. That's crazy. You know, he's yeah. compromising with you guys. He's yeah. getting paid two thousand yeah. dollars. And well, and the, the worst the worst incident. Uh, was the first time Albert King came. Okay. And Albert King's wrapping up this incredible set on a Saturday night. Mm-hmm. And some joker out of the crowd hits him in the face hits him in the face with, oh. with a with a beer can. No. And Albert just shuts the whole thing down, says, turn up the house lights, walks off. He understood it wasn't my fault. And he came back right. le- he came back a couple years later and played again. But wow. but I just was like, oh, here goes that ruins everything. Nobody's ever going to come. That reputation of the festival right. shot. And, but, you know, we survived it and uh, wow. went on. But Yeah, that's a mishap there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Backstage. I mean, you, we've already kind of talked yeah. about some of this scene, but what was the scene like backstage with the performers? Were they in and out? Did they hang out? What? Yeah, it was, it was like a big family. They were hanging out. There were a bunch... They would be back there. They would either be their wives. They'd bring their wives and their kids. Uh, uh-huh. They'd be playing, po- you know, be playing cards over in, on one side. Um, <laughs> there was a game called Tonk, which is I knew I knew Tonk because my grandparents played it. It's, it was a okay. it was a card game that they would play. They'd sit there and be playing. Uh-huh. And every so often, like when Muddy came in, you would have thought the Pope walked in the room because it, yeah. it went real quiet. And everybody was coming over to him, the artists and that, so that didn't know him. And they were like, right. I want you to meet my wife. I want you to meet my kids. And Muddy was uh-huh. Muddy just sort of brushed it off and things went back to the way they were. But uh, it was it was very it was very uh just like it was like being at home. I mean it, it was ama- that was the cool. most amazing thing about him is they were like it, it, there wasn't any difference. Yeah. You know, between the way they they were just that's who they were. They weren't. They weren't coming in all pretentious. No. And they weren't coming in. I'm um, high. You know, almighty. They were. They were wanting to give the people a good show, a good showing, right. and and form relationships along the way. Right. <laughs> exactly. And even BB King was like that when he he didn't play at the festival, but uh-huh. uh, a couple of years after the festival, some guys who had worked the festival brought him into the more civic. And, okay. And BB was even like that. I mean, he was one of the most kind, and and he had every right, I guess, to be as much of an arrogant person as you'd want. You're right. But he, yeah. he was just one of the most gentle and kind, generous people you'd ever want to meet. Wow. So, yeah. That's, that's amazing. We talked about the city of South Bend and the university. Mm-hmm. Do you do you recall, were the fans mostly, or most of the audience there, the city, mostly students, a good mix? Um, it, was a, it got to be a good mix. Uh, there was, okay. Because, I guess, of word of mouth and the people we knew and the fact that we relied... Uh-huh. We relied on people that we knew from from South Bend to help us with sound and lights and stuff. We got the okay. we got the word out, so there was a good mix of people. Uh-huh. Um, the university kind of resisted it the first couple of years because yeah. it was. I mean, I don't know if you've ever tried to get on campus with a car. 
but it's like oh it's... it was 10 times worse back then oh okay <laughs> but but we uh you know we finally would get look you got to open the you got to open there used to be basketball lot uh basketball courts at spice step uh-huh. and, and they let us use those as parking lots and they finally you know so it finally worked out pretty good but yeah there was a um uh, an uncomfortableness for a while with people weren't unsure because when I was an undergrad there had been some uh, real issues with uh, South Bend and, and students when they would bring in every every weekend they used to bring in bands from Chicago like okay Buckingham's or Little Eva and or the Kingsmen and mm-hmm. and there would inevitably be fights yeah and we never had any fights or anything at the festival, so. Just the whole, because the whole vibe was laid back. Yeah, it was. It really was. I mean, we did mention earlier about like uh, uh, the the racial relationship and everything like that. Were there any race issues at all? No. Mm-mm. No. No. Good. Never. Good. 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 There never because were. that was during a time that was. Yeah, it was still a little tense back then, but it yeah. it never was. They were. Everyone was very. Um, aware and attentive to the needs and and no you know there was just never any tension you never sensed anything i i find it truly amazing the being born and raised here in south bend and always having relationships with the university at that time i just it's just amazing that college kids put this show on for eight or nine years the tribune also mentioned that by 78 or 79 it was the longest running festival of that type for blues um and there was nothing else like it in the middle i just find it amazing that you yeah we were that, we know? were very fortunate i uh, i had sort of a an edge with this you know continuing the uh, making sure there was a continuum that, that happened with it because at that time i was uh, in grad when i was in grad school i was teaching and i was teaching a course called collegiate seminar to juniors and, okay. and it was required of all juniors to take it so those were my acolytes because I would always have a chance to talk about the blues and and, and, yeah. and then some of them would come in and go to the festival and then they would join in for the next year and say, I want to work on it with you. And and basically okay. that's how I built the staff. And and then we would pass it down, you know, because at one point there about, I guess, four years in, I, I took on the role as emeritus. So technically, I, I, see. I was running it, but there was a an undergraduate that was technically in charge. So you're a big consultant. You were just the yeah, I guess <laughs> the, the wily veteran. But um, <laughs> but you know that was good because it it um, it widened the scope of the kind of artists because each of these the guys that took over that role for me, uh-huh. um, they had their preferences as who they wanted to see, and and so right, we right. we brought in different people that it. I might not have reached out to, but they did, and, uh-huh. and it worked really well. Obviously, you you're a music guy. You uh, you you it's a part of your life. Uh, how was the Midwest Blues Festival at that time different from other events on on campus or other uh, anywhere? Or just in general, in general, just well, it was very it was just a very unique festival in the sense that it was. Yeah. We never brought in until the very last festival, and that's there was some. You know, it was clear the last year that the writing was on the wall. Oh, um, okay. That and there was some, uh, there was some difficulties because I couldn't help. I couldn't help select who was going to be the person to run it. They, they were like, "No, we don't. Oh. We're going to do it our own." And they, uh, but we never, up until that time, had a uh, a headliner or a featured performer who was not uh-huh. who was not African American. Okay. Now they could have white guys in their bands, right? But it, right. But the headline. But the right. whole point of the festival was dedicated to celebration, yep, culture, celebration of the blues, and the blues is an African American phenomenon, cultural phenomenon. Yep. And that's what we did. Mm-hmm. And um, toward the end, it became more of a money making proposition. Yeah. They were like, yeah. you know, this and that. So. The last year had a good lineup th- uh-huh. that I helped and some other guys helped put together, but they also insisted there was a, a, a white woman who was like a Janis Joplin wannabe type performer who yeah. who volunteered to perform for free. And so I was like, no, 
we we've got our lineup. We don't need her. And they were like, no, you don't understand. We need to, we want her here and this and that. And I fought with them and that was pretty much the end of it. Um, yeah. But she was awful. So, I mean, my, I proved, <laughs> I, I proved, I proved out, you know, because a lot of people came to me afterwards and said, you were right. She didn't, be- <laughs> she didn't belong here. But then they made the decision that they were going to go towards a more country Western theme. I mean, this was oh, the time, yeah. this was the time of the urban cowboy movie and, Okay. There was a bar downtown. I don't know if you you probably, you would never remember it. There was a bar called Partners, that was a country western right. bar that had a bull in it. That it was like a little miniature Gillies or something like you, uh-huh. like you saw an urban cowboy and you know so so everybody was walking around with cowboy hats and boots and thought you know thought they were all that and, and South Bend. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Next. You'll hear Perry describe the impact that the Midwest Blues Festivals had on our area. Just listen to all that it added to the local blues scene. The impact of the festival was not just the festival itself. Um, Shortly after the festival, we had, like I said, B.B. King came in twice. He came into the Moore Civic and he came into McLaughlin Auditorium. You had um, Vegetable Buddies, Uh which was bike... um, college students Notre Dame, mm-hmm. Notre Dame grad you can look up uh, on Facebook you look up original vegetable buddies and to see the history of the place but, uh-huh. but vegetable buddies was in large part an extension of or an after uh, uh, of, of the blues of the uh, okay the, the blues festival um, River City Records which was the record store that uh, Pete Kernan founded I worked with him a while on that was uh also came out of the festival um, really because he's he could see what we were doing we were selling selling records and selling bunches of records at the festivals so that came out of it uh, bluegrass festival at bendix woods came from the, yes came from yes. the festival and i was lucky you know they came to me and asked me to put it together and i you know i produced it and and emceed it and but that was back back a ways back um you know they had the cams island festivals uh-huh. You have right. um, the Germantown or the uh, Crumbstown Firefighters Festival. Uh-huh. Those were all people who were wow. influenced. Um, Harvey Stouffer, Old Harv, and uh-huh. WVPE with, with uh, the Blues Review, and Brad Nabalski, who also was with the Blues Review. The Blues Review was started in, what, 80, I want to say 83. So that soon after the soon after the festival, yeah, I had a uh, I had a blues program from eighty five to eighty eight on VVE called Back to the Blues. Har- okay. Harvey and Brad would do contemporary blues stuff. I would do the old stuff. Okay. So and then one would so mine would sort of segue into theirs. Uh, even the Midway Tavern, even the Midway Tavern. Oh yeah. That that came after the blues festival, but. But again, the the roots were already there. You know, with a place like Nesbitt's. Uh-huh. You know, Albert King was would tell me what a rocking place Nesbitt's was. Uh, Did you remember what he said about it at all? Or? He just would go on about what a great place, and he used to come there all the time, and he loved it. Um, you know, so I mean, it was just I wish I had known more about it. I did, but right. but like you pointed out, with with the information, it closed in seventy. Seventy, yeah, yeah. But um, and then of course um. South Bend itself had a was rich in the blue in the music because you have, you know Junior Wells went to high school in South Bend or not Junior Central? not Junior Wells I'm sorry Junior Walker oh okay yeah Junior, was it Central I would assume it, I would assume it was yeah. Central uh, yeah. but he went there um, Billy uh, was it Billy Nix Sticks yeah but, oh, Nix that's right yeah he yep. he was a high school. Uh, buddy of of junior walker matter of fact he was the one that got junior involved and junior could you know you could see junior all around town back in the 70s and 80s junior would be playing a lot of places even after nesbitt's closed so that's why so you had that so there's a lot of um there's just a lot of stuff that flowed from the festival and and it really you know if you wanted to pursue it i would you know really encouraged talking to like Brad Nabalski or, or Harvey Stouffer and, and 
or at something on the Midway Tavern, even you know, because that whole right, oh yeah, that whole uh, element of what continues in South Bend. I I like to think that you know the festival contributed in some small way to to creating that presence of blues in the uh, in the community. Oh, I'm sure it did, definitely. Um, and matter of fact, this is the 1979 article. It, it said that. Uh, that it was the festival was Notre Dame's contribution to the preservation of classic American blues. <laughs> that's that's a nice that's a nice <laughs> that's a nice sentiment. We wrap it up next when I ask Perry what he's most proud of, and he should be proud. A young kid, passionate about the blues, took a risk, asked his school if he can put on a blues festival. He dove in and sparked about a decade-long series of blues festivals that by all accounts was enjoyed by many. What are you most proud of? Um, well, <laughs> let me think. There is a, uh, there's an Albert King album called Albert Live. It's a okay. double gatefold album. And if you look on the back of it, the picture of Albert King on stage at the Midwest Blues Festival with his arm around my daughter. Aww. She's like four years old then. Um, Albert came to town for the festival. He's supposed to play Saturday night. He got there about nine in the morning. We're at the house. We got we're still hung over from the after party and the night before. <laughs> the night before. <laughs> and so he called the uh, the guard at the Steppen Gate calls us and says, "There's this black guy here with a bus, and he said he's supposed to be playing somewhere tonight." And then we're like, yeah, yeah, that's that's Albert. And he said, like, well, you better get somebody over here because I'm not going to watch him all day. So, <laughs> so we got we got dressed. We went over. My daughter went with me, and uh, I I told him I said I've got some stuff to do. Do you do you mind? And he goes he goes no. He says, is there somebody to show you around campus? I said, Leslie can show you around, <laughs> or <laughs> Julia Julia can show you around. So he so my daughter spent the entire day walking around campus with Albert. <laughs> And then, then at then at the festival that night, he says, um, after he comes up on stage and does his little intro, he says, "I got a new, I got a new girlfriend. I need everybody to introduce everybody to." Aww. And he called her up. And um, and there's some other pictures on the back of the album. You can tell if you know Steppen, you can tell they okay. were taken at Steppen Center. That's amazing. But but that's, really, that's cool. really, I guess what what I'm most proud of is simply that, um, you know, we did make a difference, and and the music, yeah. the music continues. You know, and that's the important yeah. Yeah, because it's always to me and, and I think to everybody that worked on Midwest Midwest Blues, it's always been all about the blues. It's it's never been an ego trip for any of us, you know. And Perry, <laughs> after talking to you for the past forty minutes, I could tell it's literally you you did it for the love of the blues. You did it, you know, uh, to to spread the, the, the love of all of that. So you can just tell hundred percent. Yeah, well that's awesome. and, and you know, it, it's just um it it's those guys have been ripped off long enough by everybody that you can imagine. And to be able wow. to just, and I think that was one of the reasons why we had that camaraderie, that, that friendliness with them and everything yeah. else is they knew that we weren't after anything at all, except to hear them play. Wow. You know? That's yes. That's it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's it. They, they found a group of kids who love the, the, just love the, wholesome blues you know rather than making money off it exactly and and there were those people around unfortunately thank you for listening to another episode of round the bend now and then an extra special thanks to perry aberly for joining the show and sharing the story of the midwest blues festival again perry you should hold your head high and be proud for your contributions to spreading the love of the blues in the michiana area folks do me a favor, leave a review on the podcast app that you listen to us on. Follow us on all the socials, Twitter, Round the Bend Pod, Facebook, Round the Bend Now and Then. Email, reach out, roundthebend574 at gmail.com. As always, share the podcast with anyone that you feel would appreciate it. Join us again next time as we learn more about South Bend and Mishawaka's Now and Then.